each and every one uh, and provide more details uh, about, you know, how to prepare for exams, how to prepare for, you know, for your ward rounds, how to prepare your patient and etc. There are so many things that I receive on a daily basis. So I, you know, uh, decided to actually um, uh, add a new dimension to my news agenda. And um, so I added, I'm now going to add a broadcast, a podcast so, uh, for all of you in which I will be um, individually, individually um, sharing my episodes on how to prepare for exams and it will give you more details. I will be able to help you even more with that podcasting. So if you have more queries or any question that you wish me to um, wish to ask me and uh, according to my own experience, I will try my very best to guide you as much as possible. But there were a few questions that I be, I've received and there were so some questions which were very frequent that's why i decided to um, start my own podcast i will be sharing the link with all of you soon so again uh thank you very 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 much for joining and uh, i'll be you know starting uh, this webinar one hour from now professor michael lurton will be joining us in an hour from now and if you have any questions or queries or suggestions or comments please feel free to use the chat box to share all of your wonderful questions queries and suggestions and the questions will be taken up um you know after the after uh you know the after the session is over so the right time again is one hour from now but i'm so happy to see that you are all here and uh, the webinar uh, the certificates for the previous webinar have been already emailed to everyone who has taken part in the quest and this uh, the certificate for this webinar will be generated automatically after submission of the quest so please um uh, submit your quiz and uh you know again the grading doesn't matter because i haven't set a passing grade previously there was uh, a glitch in in that passing percentage that's why uh you know the certificates were not gener generated automatically so um uh, there was a little glitch in that so i sent them manually to each and everyone who took part in uh yeah sure please do but you have to, you know, in order to attain uh, your certificate, you will have to submit the quiz, okay? Because that's how we take, uh, uh, we, that's how we record all of the attendance. All of these MCQs are generally for your own practice and they won't be, you know, uh, like uh, I'm not going to say that it's going to, uh, your grading is going to affect at all because, you know, these are all for your very, very own um um, you know, you can say it's for your own practice and learning. I have curated uh, these questions, these MTQs, based on what I think would, was important for everyone to know. Um. I have, uh, you know, given a space uh, in, on the certificate, Dr. Altenari, Dr. Mustafa Altenari, I guess I've uh, uh, placed, you know, an empty blank space on the certificate where you can add your name, you can add it in on PDF editor and you can add your name on it. But today the the, the certificate that will be gener generated automatically will have your name on it um, through, you know, uh, when you will put it on, on, on the quiz form. Oh yes, exactly. So you have to, Dr. Sirajuddin, you will have to um submit the quiz in order to receive your certificate. But today's certificate will have your name on it automatically generated. But uh, you know, the last time uh, we had that little glitch according to the passing percentage. Uh, so it's okay. It's um otherwise it doesn't matter because it is just for your own practice and learning. So you just try to have a little bit of um. 
you know the only thing that i that we need is to keep a record for everyone that um, who has attended the webinar so we have general generated that you know google quiz so that's why we need your um your submissions for the purpose of realizing and issuing that certificate Okay, Dr. Sirajuddin, I will ask uh, my, I will forward it to my tech and um, uh, he will probably check your attendance from there and will gener generate your um, uh, certificate and send it to you. So again, thank you very, very much everyone who has um, um, joined the meeting today and uh, the meeting will start in one hour so if you have any questions or queries please feel free to send it in in the in the chat box Um, hello again, everyone. I just want to let you know that the 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 you know um uh, webinar will start one hour from now. Uh, so okay, if you'll just uh... okay regarding the quiz, yes, I will be sharing the the link to that that quiz in the chat box. You will have to just submit the quiz, and the certificate will be generated automatically. I will be sharing the link to that to to the quiz by the end of this webinar. It's very easy. It's a Google form, basically. So you don't have to go through a lot of it.
Uh, well, actually, the lecture will start from one hour, uh, one hour from now, so you will have to, you know, uh, get locked in, in one hour from now. I'm sorry for that. Uh, there was a confusion over there because there was a uh, flower confusion in 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 the in the setup because the mountain time is. Uh, you know, I have it readjusted because daylight saving. But uh, I think that I'm going to, uh, in the meantime, as we wait here, I think I can put the previous webinar on brainstem cavernomas by Professor Michael Lawton uh, in the, uh, you know, in, in the in, in, in Zoom. If there is any other webinar that you wish to see, if you have missed, if you want to see the webinar by Professor Henry Schroeder, please uh, write in the chat box and I will... Um, Put it on you know in, on the screen so just uh, let me know which webinar would you like to uh would you like to uh, see i think i will be for the sake of context i will prefer preferably um show you the webinar by professor uh, michael lawton he had uh Previous previous webinar with us on brainstem cavernomas. Uh, I'm I'm not sure how many of you have actually seen that particular webinar, uh, by Professor Lawton. Let me show you. Sure, sir. No problem at all, sir. It's okay. Uh, sometimes that happens. I think Zoom has a little uh, issue with the with video right now because I had a lot of problem setting up my own camera. So probably it's it's the app issue that's taking, that's uh, having uh, us a little facing this little glitch. So again, thank you so much, sir. Uh, I think uh, if you allow me, I can uh, I will start the webinar as soon as you allow me to do so. Okay, I'm ready. Thank you so much, sir. Again, thank you so much. We are honored to welcome the legendary Professor Michael Lawton today with us. Professor Michael Lawton does not need any introduction at all, but for the sake of formality, I'm pleased to give a brief introduction. Professor Michael Lawton uh, is the president and CEO of Barrow Neurological Institute and the chair of the Department of Neurological Surgery. Uh, his expertise includes cerebrovascular diseases, of course, and skull-based tumors. He has experience in treating more than 5,200 brain aneurysms, 900 and 90 AVMs and about a thousand cavernous malformations, including 300 in the brainstem and other delicate areas. We know him for his uh, Lawton Young um, supplementary grading system. I think it was the one of the earliest questions I've been asked when I started my own residency. So I know we had a case of AVM and they asked me this question. And I, I was so happy that I knew it uh, back then. So it was um, like it's so much important clinically that we use it each day. Uh, but Professor Michael Lawton has also proposed this uh, grading system for the brainstem cavernous malformations. I have shared all these links on my WhatsApp group and on my Facebook, uh, so you can just go through them if you want to read the whole article. I think many of us already know it who are clinically practicing, so uh, most of us uh, are already using them as to just having a lot of good experience in um, knowing our own cases. So uh, the vital Lawton grading, this supplementary is very 
uh, much uh, famous already, but the French papillomavirus is a real, it's a new one. So we all know about it, but we are just uh, going through it, um, reading it. I've shared this link for with all of you. Uh, these are some of the very important papers. And we also know him for his seven series, the trilogy that has already been published. And indeed, it equates to the seven wonders uh, of neurological surgery. The seven papillomavirus is a compilation of articles that have been published by the JNS, and I have also shared the link um, to, to that uh, compilation. You can find it. I will also share it again uh, in the chat box so that you can uh, find it if you um, haven't yet seen them. So it is um, something very important. Also, many of you might have seen uh, his uh, seven series videos on the BNI website, and these are really important for us, especially the young neurosurgeons who are just learning, and I think it's for the senior ones as well to have a very good insight uh, because Mm, we know you cannot be um, he's a master and uh, some of sometimes we wonder how someone can operate that nicely in those precarious areas so it's um it's uh, like when we invited you sir i was so overwhelmed and i told my colleagues about you so again thank you so much for coming today um, um it's, it's a matter of real honor and i think that uh, there is no description that describes what you have been doing for neurosurgery not only for the patient but also for the trainees on and everyone who is around the world and all your teaching is going to translate into a much better and improved healthcare. And um, we will uh, be having the privilege of inviting Professor Sessler Lotton next um, uh, in uh, on 19 February. So again, I really want to invite everyone who is here to please join us on 19 February to attend this lecture. Uh, Professor Lotter, welcome. Thank you so much. Thank you so much for coming. for accepting our invitation today uh, we are really honored and pleased to have you and we are obliged that you accepted our invitation even uh, during your very busy schedule and even it's quite early in um, your part of the world sir welcome and the floor is all yours now great thank you so much um i'd like to share my screen can you um Enable that for me. Uh, sure, sir. I, I just uh, see uh, if there is. Uh, oh, oh, OK. Sorry. Uh, 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 sir, can you share your screen now? Let's try now. There we go. OK. Perfect. Thank um, you so much. So, yeah, so um, you should see in just a second my title slide. Can you see that? Perfectly, sir. Sorry? Perfectly, sir. We can see. Oh, OK, great. Perfectly. Great. Um, all right, well, thank you, Nora. Um, I appreciate the invitation and um, appreciate the opportunity to speak. Um, just to be clear, um, what do we have? We have um, an hour? Exactly. We do have an hour, but you can take as long as you like, because uh, uh, this is uh, solely your own show. So you can take okay. as long as you like. OK, I have to be finished at uh, seven o'clock my time because uh, I have another meeting to go to. But um, so I'll, I'll go ahead and get going. Um, so what I thought I would talk about is um, brainstem cavernous malformations. And as um, as mentioned, I've been um, focused on these over the last um, two years just trying to put my next book together which uh, we're almost done with um the uh, the book is on um cavernous malformations throughout the brain 
and it's coming out as a collection in uh, JNS. And you know, the goals for the book were to, um, like for some of the others, develop a, a taxonomy for cavernous malformations. Um, talk about tissue sparing approaches to get there, and then um, overall, just uh, to improve the uh, clinical diagnosis and decision making that goes into the management. So um, that was the uh, the goal of the uh, the book, um, and uh, it will come out uh, once we finish the last of the journal papers. Um, so these are some of the numbers um, at last tally. Um, a lot of cases. So um, you know, I, I always I feel blessed. I, I feel the need to take my experience and um, convert that into lessons um, for others to. Uh, to learn from because it's um, not everybody who gets to, to do these kinds of numbers. And that's um, partly what motivates me. This is the outline. And for the talk, we'll get through as much of this as we can uh, in the next uh, 50 minutes or so. Uh, so let's get started. The first is patient selection. Um, it's always hard to, to pick these because, um, you know, doing surgery on the brainstem can be um, very uh, morbid for, for patients if, if you don't select the right ones. And so one of the early uh, goals was to try and find a grading system for these patients that does that didn't exist. And so we put this together as one of the first papers um, um, in this whole effort. And um, when we looked at our experience and our statistics, we found that there were five variables that mattered. There was, there was um, size, crossing the axial midpoint, uh, the presence of a DVA, age and hemorrhage. And um, these were the, the ones that kind of came out of the statistical analysis and we did a grading system that was not unlike the Spencer Martin or supplementary grading where you look at these factors, you assign these cut points and then give um, uh, points based upon um, the criteria. And you'll notice a couple of things. First, um, age has a cut point that's at 40, um, and it's a zero or two, unlike um, the um, uh, AVM grading system that has uh, three tiers. With hemorrhage, we have three tiers with zero, one, and two for acute, subacute, and chronic hemorrhage. And um, you know the, the the way I remember all of these different variables is is it's not unlike AVM grading where you have a size an eloquence variable, which here we refer to as crossing the axial midpoint, and venous drainage. Which is kind of like the presence of the DVA. So you can remember the first three, like the Spetzler Martin grading, and you can remember the last two, like um, supplementary bleeding variable, uh, except that it's timing rather than yes, no. So anyway, um, this is how the great, uh, the brainstem grading system gets put together. And when you look at the numbers, uh, small in these lower, uh, or high grade, uh, 
patients. And so uh, one of the first things we did in the series was to validate the grading system in my patients that came afterwards, plus Dr. Spetzler's page, patients. And um, what we found, um, you can see the different approaches here. We found um, a lot of similarity between the ways that uh, he and I operate, uh, which was uh, no surprise. We saw a good distribution of the uh, cavernous malformations by grade. And um, what we found was that they kind of distribute themselves into low, intermediate, and high grades, low being 0, 1, 2, intermediate being 3, 4, and 5, and high grade being 6 and 7. And there was this nice linear drop-off um, that correlated outcome with grade, which is exactly what you want a grading system to do. And it was true when you looked at both um, outcomes in terms of absolute outcomes, good and poor, um, or in terms of relative outcomes, whether the patients were worse or um, unchanged or better. And, and so um, the, the takeaway is that, um, you know, when you have um, um, high grade AVM patients, the, uh, uh, the sixes and the sevens, these are the ones to be careful of because you can see from these graphs, the, the risks go way up when you get into those, um, in those ranges. So um, you can use the brainstem cavernous malformation grading scale as a way to select your patients. And um, when they're lower intermediate, Now, um, one of the most important things, I think, from this effort is this taxonomy. And so um, I've kind of, um, uh, I've, I've put these um, uh, taxon this techno taxonomy together in terms of types and subtypes with um, type referring to location in the midbrain pons and medulla and subtype referring to the location where the lesion surfaces whether it's anterior, posterior, et cetera. Um, and so that's the way to think about the taxonomy. Uh, the data comes from my patients and Dr. Spetzler's patients, and we put these together in one database. And then um, this sort of summarizes how it works. If you look at the midbrain, uh, you see five different types. You've got tegmental uh, zone here you have a posterior one and you've got a periaqueductal subtype. So the, these are the five subtypes within the midbrain. As we go to the pons, um, you see the color coding is the same. We have an anterior uh, um, subtype here that's called the basilar uh, subtype. You've got a peritrigeminal one here in red. We've got a middle peduncular here in orange and a rhomboid uh, one here in blue. And if you look in this central zone here, this yellow, uh, this is the super olivary subtype, which um, uh, comes into the central ponds from below, which is a very uh, sneaky way to get into the central ponds from a far lateral approach, which we'll talk about later. Moving on to the medulla, you can see uh, we've got the pyramidal, the olivary, the cuneate, the gracile, and then down here in the ventricle, we've got the trigonal, which is the lower part of the floor of the fourth ventricle. So those are the zones. There are 16 uh, subtypes. You can uh, see this table here. If you remember the various names of the, um, the subtypes, you'll, you'll remember the zones because they're very anatomically described um, and they'll lead you right to the correct name. And the whole key to the taxonomy is just learning these names, learning the anatomy that defines the, the different uh, territories, and then doing the correct categorization. This is just another view. Um, this just shows you the midbrain pons and medulla. You can see this is the anterior view. So we see nicely the interpeduncular, the basilar, and the pyramidal uh, subtypes. As we go into the red zones, you can see peduncular. Um, you can see the... Um, uh, peritrigeminal here in the ponds, and you can see olivary down here. As we uh, go around more laterally, uh, you start to see the orange territory of the tegmental, middle peduncular, and cuneate zones. And then um, on this next slide, we're going around to the back where you can see quadrigeminal, 
You can see the floor of the fourth ventricle, the rhomboid and the trigonals. And, uh, and then lastly, the green zones, the gracile, the inferior peduncular, and periaqueductal up at the top. So um, um, that's the taxonomy. Uh, one other thing we wanted to introduce was this notion of giant cavernomas. Uh, we have a giant definition for aneurysms, for uh, AVMs, for pituitary lesions, um, but not for cavernomas. And so we, we threw this one out there. Um, we looked at the relative risks of a functional decline. And um, we found that as the size grew from two and a half centimeters all the way up to four, the greatest um, change in outcome was after three. You can see this jump here. And, and so we decided that um, this was a good cut point for the, the definition of giant. And so we, we, we view anything that's three centimeters or greater as a giant lesion. And uh, that's what we recommend as the um, kind of the, uh, the cutoff for the definition. The graph here just shows you that unlike a lot of lesions, tumors, for example, or aneurysms, the size of a cavernous malformation is dynamic. Uh, it generally is increasing, but sometimes it can decrease um, as the blood gets reabsorbed. Uh, sometimes it can jump up quite dramatically with a, with a hemorrhage and so forth. So you, you have to always sort of reassess the size uh, of the lesion. Now, um, one of the things that um, the taxonomy tells you is, um, is what clinical constellation or syndrome you can expect with these patients. The anatomy of the brainstem is so loaded that lesions in specific areas um, will tell you exactly what subtype you're dealing with. Um, it, it's not unlike what um, we learned from the stroke syndromes um, many, many uh, decades ago by our um, astute neurologist, the, the symptoms from a stroke would tell you exactly what part of the brainstem the stroke was in. Well, the same is true with um, cavernous malformations. You can see if you look at the subtypes according to their, um, their different uh, symptomatology, each one of these columns has a different heat map, a different pattern of green and red. And so there, there is this, uh, constellation of symptoms that really matches the syndrome here. And so you can really um, come to your diagnosis of the malformation just by having a really good neurological bedside exam and recognizing the, uh, the syndrome and pairing that with the, uh, with the subtype. So I'll show you some examples. The interpeduncular uh, lesion is shown here. Uh, this is the, um, uh, the Claude syndrome. And uh, you can see how um, a lesion in the interpeduncular lateral cerebellar ataxia and an ipsilateral oculomotor nerve palsy. And the presence of those symptoms will lead you right to this localization of the cavernous malformation. Uh, if we go on to the peduncular lesion, uh, this is your uh, classic um, Weber syndrome. And so instead of the um, uh, um, ataxia, this is more uh, in the, uh, the peduncle. And so you have a contralateral hemiparesis or hemiplegia with your third nerve palsy. And that localizes or identifies the uh, peduncular subtype rather than the interpeduncular subtype. As we go around to the tegmentum, uh, for some of these, we just didn't find an equivalent or pre-existing uh, stroke syndrome, so we, we have to define our own. This is what we call a lemniscal syndrome uh, because it impacts the uh, trigeminal, the medial, and lateral lemnisci in this tegmental zone of the posterolateral midbrain. Uh, you can see how it um, affects those tracts. It will cause facial numbness. It will cause pain and temperature disruption, and it will affect uh, vibration and fine touch. So. It, it really hits those three uh, tracks, and in addition, uh, the spinal thalamic tract, which is your pain and temperature tract, which is uh, sitting right here next to the medial lemniscus. Moving around to the quadrigeminal plate, we all know paranoid syndrome with um, paresis of up gaze, light near dissociation, and this comes from these lesions back here, right around the posterior commissure and um, superior colliculi and affecting the, uh, the nerve nuclei here. Um, periaqueductal lesions can cause a Nafnagel syndrome. 
uh, and um, it's very much like the Claude syndrome, but, but usually a little lower down, uh, depending on where you are relative to the decusation of the uh, superior cerebellar peduncle. That will um, determine whether your ataxia is ipsy or contralateral, and um, uh, you've got your um, oculomotor nerve paresis as well. So um, this is just uh, to show you how you know you can go through all of these, the pons, you can go through uh, the various uh, pontine syndromes that correlate. You have the peritrigeminal syndromes that affect the um, uh, both the uh, corticospinal tract and the MCP here and cause some ataxia. You have the, uh, the middle peduncular lesions that cause ipsilateral face, uh, hemisensory loss, the contralateral uh, medial lumniscus symptoms, uh, the spinal thalamic tract. And um, you, you can essentially make your diagnoses without MRIs. You can make it with just um, a good clinical examination and this um, putting together of the findings. The INO is classic for lesions in the floor of the fourth ventricle in the pontine segment. And these are the various types of an INO that you can get uh, depending on the level of the lesion. Um, here's this super olivary pontine lesion. This is classic, causes a six nerve palsy. Ipsilateral to the lesion as the nerve exits the pontomedullary sulcus. And um, um, sometimes you'll get a fifth or a seventh nerve associated with that as well shown here, uh, the Miller-Gubler syndrome. And moving on down into the medulla, same story. You can get a pyramidal syndrome here with Desjardins syndrome with um, tongue deviation and a hemiparesis that is um, contralateral. And finally, um, the cuneate lesion um, causes a posterior Wall Wallenberg syndrome. And the, um, the ones towards the back are much easier. They affect the uh, um, uh, dorsal column nuclei here, just causing leg uh, numbness, isolated leg numbness that could be ipsy or uh, uh, bilateral. And then um, uh, trigonal. These are the ones in the floor of the fourth ventricle below the stria medullaris that cause um, uh, dysphagia and dysphonia, as well as severe nausea and vomiting. So that's a very quick run through the various clinical syndromes. Um, and um, you know, hopefully you'll have time to look at the publications in more detail and study the, the, the illustrations. The illustrations are fantastic. Um, you know, I had my artists here work on those and um, they bring together these uh, wonderful circuits um, and uh, the pathology and the, they, they do require some study, but uh, I think uh, hopefully if you do that, you'll get a sense of um, how these lesions fit with the uh, with the pathways in the brainstem and cause these clinical constellations. So <clears throat> moving on to the approaches, the, the real benefit in my mind of the taxonomy is the approach selection. I think one of the hardest things with these lesions is first patient selection, but then second, um, surgical selection. Should I uh, operate and, and how should I operate? And each one of these um, subtypes has its own unique uh, approach. And the beauty of the taxonomy is that if you categorize the, the lesion according to the subtype, it will pair the lesion with the what I would call the correct approach. And so um, that's really the beauty is you, you, once you have a subtype, you have, uh, it will lead you to the approach. And so I'll just walk you through um, through the approaches. This is the interpeduncular lesion. The approach is an orbitozygomatic craniotomy, and we're gonna go transylvian and interpeduncular. And so this is the ultimate surgical view that you're gonna get. It's very much like approaching a Basler apex aneurysm, where you go uh, lateral to the carotid, medial to the third nerve, you follow the third nerve back to the Basler apex, and just behind that, you're going to get to the interpeduncular fossa, you're gonna work through the thalamoperforates and you'll get uh, to the lesion here. There are safe entry zones that are available. Um, they are the um, uh, interpeduncular safe entry zone right in the middle. And um, you can see the valuable real estate is the red nuclei and the corticospinal tracts, which uh, lie just to the side. Um, so that's the interpeduncular approach. Uh, I'll skip uh, the videos in the interest of time. 
uh, and just show you the artwork here. This next one is the peduncular lesion. Uh, this now is the same craniotomy, same transylvian approach, but instead of going medial to the third nerve, we'll be going lateral to the third nerve, right to the, the uh, cerebral peduncle, which you see here. So our uh, safe entry zone, if necessary, is the anterior mesencephalic, straight ent uh, safe entry zone, and we have to stay medial to the corticospinal tract. The, um, Oops, let me uh, skip this as well. The next one is the tegmental uh, cavernous malformation. I like to do these in the sitting position uh, through a retrosigmoid craniotomy. That allows the cerebellum to, to descend a little bit with gravity. And um, it takes us right to this uh, posterior lateral surface of the, um, of the midbrain. The fourth nerve you see right in the center here. And um, it's a very uh, helpful landmark that will guide your, your um, your dissection. Um, the distal branches of the SCA are also uh, right in the field. Um, so you have to choose a pathway either. This is your safe entry zone. It's where the cruise of the peduncle ends and the um, uh, tegmentum begins. And usually it's overlying, uh, overlied by this lateral mesencephalic vein, and you can enter right in that spot. The, um, the uh, next one here is the um, quadrigeminal um, lesion here. This one I do from a um, sitting position, again, uh, supracerebellar infratentorial uh, approach um, in the midline uh, through a torcular craniotomy. You see the torcular craniotomy here. Uh, straight down the middle, and it takes you to uh, what I refer to as the infragalenic triangle. It's that space between basal vein of Rosenthal, the precentral cerebellar vein, just right in that little angle right there. And uh, this gives you a perfect shot. Uh, there are multiple safe entry zones that you can use, the um, uh, intercollicular, supracollicular, or infracollicular safe entry zones. Uh, but typically, these lesions are right there on the surface, and um, you can get right to it uh, through uh, just entering the lesion directly. The uh, eloquent anatomy is shown in the lower right. You have to watch the superior and inferior colliculi. Deep to them is the red nucleus. You have the decussation of the fourth nerves um, below them, which you need to stay above. Uh, but this provides a very nice corridor. And with this gravity retraction and sitting position, uh, you have a nice open space. The, um, the next one is um, the periaqueductal. This one is um, uh, a beautiful approach. Uh, I do this through a bifrontal, transcolossal, transcoroidal fissure approach. You can see the uh, beautiful anatomy in this picture. With gravity, the, uh, the dependent hemisphere will drop so that you can get right down the interhemispheric fissure to the corpus callosum. A um, transcolossal dissection will take you into the lateral ventricle. As you open up the choroidal fissure, you enlarge the foramen of Monroe, which you see right here. You'll enlarge that backwards so that you open into the third ventricle. You come upon the massa intermedia. You come upon the medial walls of the thalamus. And if you keep aiming back, you'll see the aqueduct. And these lesions typically sit along this rim, around the rim of the um, uh, the aqueduct, so they're the, in the very top of the midbrain, which is the floor of the third ventricle, and uh, that will take you there. All right, so um, looking at the midbrain, you can see um, these are the different subtypes, the various um, uh, really uh, performed well. The patients did well, and um, you know we had uh, we had uh, good outcomes seen. So um, next is the pons. The, the pons has uh, six subtypes and six different unique approaches. And I'll just uh, walk you through those. Uh, the first is the basilar subtype. And that for that, we just do a terional with a quasi uh, uh, approach. So the quasi's bone of the uh, anterior petrous bone is shown here. Uh, the borders for that are the GSPN, 
lateral border of the fifth nerve, superior petrosal sinus and the petrous ridge, and arcuate eminence. I think all of you are well aware of Kawazu's triangle. And when you open that space and work between five and seven, you have a nice shot at the anterior surface of the pons. You can see your lateral to the basilar. You're working between these um, circumflex perforators off of the basilar trunk, and this provides your window. Um, the, these lesions sit medial to what I call the trans-olivary line. This is a term from Roten, uh, drawing a line up from the uh, midpoint of the olive, or um, the six nerve will give you a sense of that, uh, that same uh, anatomy. And so if you see six and you're medial to six, you're in that basilar territory. Hello, sir. Uh, hello, sir. Hello, sir. Professor Lawton, I can see you. Um, yeah. Actually, we'll, I, I was uh, airing the previous version. I just stopped sharing it. Sir, can you hear me? Yeah. Can you see me? Thank you very, very much, sir, for joining us today. Yeah. Um, oops. Can you uh, see me? No, sir, we cannot see you. Mm -hmm. Sir, I have made you a co-host so that you can actually have um, everything at your own disposal. <laughs> Sorry, what's that? Uh, sir, I have uh, made you the co-host uh, for this meeting so that you have everything on your own disposal. Uh, but we cannot still see you. Uh, we cannot see your video. Yeah. Okay. Uh, hold on. Thank you, sir. Not sure why that's not going. <laughs> yes, uh, we can see you now. Uh, so we can see you now. Okay, good. <laughs> Thank you very, very much, sir, for joining us today. We are so excited and we've been waiting for you since the last one hour because we were so excited. We never wanted to miss uh, even a single moment of your lecture. Oh. Well, Thank you. um, I'm not scheduled to speak until uh, uh, now, right? Am I late? Uh no, 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 so not at all. You are not late at all. You have got six minutes to start your lecture. Oh, okay. uh, we were so we were so excited, sir. First of all, please uh, uh, accept our congratulations on receiving the prestigious Cushing Award, sir. Oh, thank you. Appreciate that. Thank you very, very much, sir. Uh, sir, so we all we were all so much excited to have you here with us today again for for another time. So, uh, we've been um in the meantime, I was airing the previous uh, episode of your uh webinar with us. So uh, again, thank you so so much for joining us today, sir. Sir, My would pleasures. you, sir, would you like to um test your slides? Yeah. Uh, how much time uh, is this lecture? Uh, so uh, it's actually uh, just a single speaker lecture. So as much as you like, usually uh, it is about a uh, half an hour to one hour long, but as much as you like, because everyone will be so excited to hear you. Okay. Uh, let me share my screen. Do you, do you want me to share my screen? Is that what yes. you want? Yes. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Please. Uh, yes, sir. We can we can see. All right, that should be the um, title slide right there. Exactly. So exactly, we can see. It. Uh, sir, would you like to join in now? Because I think people will keep on joining in. Uh, so you've got four minutes. Um, and you can join four minutes before the actual time because I know you have got a very busy schedule. Okay, so let me um, stop it. <laughs> Stop the share. That'll work. Um, uh, and, uh, yeah, when, when you're ready, um, I'll just uh, switch over. Thank you very, very much, sir. I think that uh, 
uh, people are say, sending you a lot of wishes and regards in, in the chat box. So again, sir, right, thank you very, very much. Uh, sir, I think I can proceed with a very, very brief introduction. Uh, actually, Professor uh, Michael Austin, you do not need any formal introduction because every one of us knows you so, so well. And uh, I can remember that it was one my first day on training. Um, and the first thing that they asked me was uh, one of your own references and one of your papers. So uh, actually, you are one of our big uh, inspiration in neurosurgery. So, um, uh, for the sake of formality, sir, uh, I would like to have a moment to give a very, very brief introduction to the attendees because most of us know you so well, and it feels like um, it's it's a very big formality. So, uh, for but uh, I would like to say a few words. As we all know, the Professor Michael T. Lawton obviously doesn't need any introduction, but he's, um, for the sake of formality, he's the president and CEO of the Barrow Neurological Institute and the Robert F. Spessler Indoor Chair in Neurosciences and Chair of the Department of Neurosurgery. Uh, Professor Lawton's neurosurgical expertise includes cerebrovascular disorders and skull based tumors. He has experience in trading more than 5,250 brain aneurysms, 1,200 AVMs and 1,200 cavernous malformation, including more than 400 in the brain stem and other highly delicate areas of the brain. And most of it, he's the recipient of the prestigious Cushing Awards, and he has been through so many leadership roles in neurosurgery. He has written so many chapters and books, and there are more than 900 publications by Professor Michael Lawton, and obviously he's the he's, he's the um, you know he's the leader in cerebral vascular surgery, and he's one of our inspirations, one of my personal inspirations, and we are all so much big fans. So it's a big, big pleasure, sir, to welcome you here with us today again to deliver a lecture on uh, cerebral cavernous malformations as part of your cyber cavernoma. Sir, I'm a huge fan of all of your wonderful operative videos, and we, um, I, me and my colleagues, we keep on watching and re-watching all of your videos and everything that you have shared so far. We owe you, uh, owe you so much in neurosurgery. So um, I think we do not have words to say how much we are grateful to you for virtual teaching us and we feel like um, we are we are being mentored virtually by someone like you so it's a big thing so thank you very very much for all of your virtual education and for your dedication in neurosurgical education well thank you i appreciate the kind introduction let me uh go ahead and share my screen and hit play and um I can get started. Well, thank you. It's uh, always a pleasure to see you again, and uh, uh, congratulations on all the fine work you're doing in getting people to um, tune into webinars and uh, learn more neurosurgery. So uh, my last lecture was on um, the brainstem, and um, I think what we'll do today is just carry on and talk about the cerebral cavernous malformations. It's part of the um, the book project that um, I'm trying to finish up, and uh, the book uh, is coming along nicely. Hopefully, we'll have it to you um, in a year uh, so that you can actually have uh, everything that I've been telling you uh, on video, uh, on paper, and collected in one uh, in one book. So hopefully, that will be uh, out there soon. Uh, as of right now, it's part of this um, Seven Cavernomas collection in JNS, and the, the purpose of this um, is to develop a taxonomy for these lesions. Uh, advanced tissue sparing approaches, and ultimately to improve us as neurosurgeons, both in terms of um, our diagnostic acumen, but also the decisions we make, the treatments that we select, and the patient outcomes that we get. So um, this is uh, a new uh, slide that we just finished uh, developing. This is a, um, a model of the brain that summarizes all of the uh, different subtypes of the of the brain and the taxonomy. Uh, what you see is uh, now the brainstem, cerebellum, the cerebrum, and the deep um, hemisphere structures, the thalamus and the basal ganglia. And that's really the seven different um, uh, cavernoma types in the taxonomy. And um, within each of the seven types, there are subtypes. So breakdowns within each type that allow you to really um, specify exactly what each lesion is and identify them so that um, you can then um, figure them out and make your decisions correctly. So this this illustration summarizes them all. And um, the last lecture, I talked about the stuff in the brainstem. Uh, so this one will um, 
confine ourselves to the uh, to the cerebrum. This is what we talked about the last time. These are the um, different subtypes in the midbrain, pons, and medulla. You can see there's five in the midbrain, six in the pons, and five in the medulla. They're based upon the surface that the lesion presents to. The um, names are listed here. So you've got uh, in the midbrain, the interpeduncular and the peduncular. In the pons, you've got the basilar and the peritrigeminal, as well as the middle peduncular. And then the medullary uh, type, you've got the pyramidal, olivary, and cuneid. And as we look around to the back, we see the additional subtypes, the quadrigeminal, the rhomboid, and the trigonal in the posterior surface. Then you've got the tegmental, middle peduncular, inferior peduncular, and the gracile in the green uh, in the posterior lateral spaces. Um, what was nice about the brainstem is when you subtype these, you uh, arrived at these discrete um, uh, syndromes. These, uh, for example, the Claude syndrome for the lesions that are located in the interpeduncular fossa with a third nerve palsy and a uh, red nucleus injury affecting the superior cerebellar peduncle. So um, by knowing the taxonomy, you could localize these at the bedside and make your diagnosis before ever seeing uh, the MRI. And here's another example for the peduncular midbrain. If it's in the peduncle, you're going to get your third nerve plus your contralateral hemiparesis, which um, will uh, take you to exactly what, what uh, subtype you're dealing with. We have that in the pons as well. And these uh, heat maps were nice in mapping all of these different clin clinical syndromes out. Um, the beauty, though, is when you have the subtype, it's going to tell you exactly what your surgical approach will be. And this is uh, just a summary of the different approaches to the brainstem and how by subtyping each of the lesions, it'll tell you exactly the surgical approach. Uh, so just to give you a couple of examples, here's the quadrigeminal midbrain lesion that's right in the quadrigeminal or, uh, plate or the tectum, uh, approach with the torcular craniotomy, sitting position, and a midline supracerebellar approach. Um, one of the concepts in the brainstem was this triangle concept, meaning that you needed not only to define your craniotomy, which is where you start, but also the approach and the triangle ultimately that takes you to your target. Um, and also uh, knowing the safe entry zone is also important in case the lesion is not there on the surface. These are the different triangles that we covered. And uh, these are the ones more posteriorly. These are the essentially what aim your trajectory to the target. This slide summarizes the safe entry zones. And these, uh, again, were covered in the last lecture, but you can see 21 different safe entry zones. And your knowledge of these will really help you uh, avoid uh, going through critical nuclei or track that, tracks that might cause some damage. We also talked about brainstem cavernous malformation grading and how if you were to grade these based upon five different variables, the size, the crossing of the axial midpoint, presence of a DVA, patient age, and the chronicity of hemorrhage, that these will distribute your patients um, and allow you to predict your surgical outcome in advance. And these can guide some of the selection decisions. So um, that's basically a recap of the last time we were together. And um, now what we'll do is um, just show you how the rest of the seven cavernomas uh, taxonomy fills out. Um, we're going to cover um, these regions here, the deep cerebral lesions and the superficial cerebral lesions, which encompasses thalamus, basal ganglia, and cerebrum. So we'll start with the thalamus. Um, the thalamus is shown here. Um, all of its various nuclei are well-defined and, and partitioned, and you can see these divisions uh, in, into these different color schemes. These are the six different thalamic subtypes, and they pretty much obey the divisions um, defined by this nuclear anatomy. So we have an anterior subtype that encompasses the anterior thalamic nuclei. We have a lateral subtype in red, the biggest of the subtypes that's um, lateral to the internal medullary lamina. And then we have a medial type in yellow that's forming the lateral wall of the third ventricle. We've got a, a group here in green, the choroidal type. These are the, um, uh, um, the uh, lateral nuclei of the thalamus, the LP and the LD. Um, and then um, lastly, we've got the pulvinar in the back together with the geniculates in orange off to the 
posterior inferior aspect of the thalamus. So, so these are the six different subtypes. And um, again, they correspond to the different nuclear groups as we learn them in medical school. These are um, different views of the, the thalami. Uh, you can see the anterior group, the ventral group, which is your lateral group, uh, the geniculi over here, the pulvinar looking at it from the back. As we look at it from the top, you can see how the, the medial group forms that wall of the third ventricle. This is the inferior group, uh, or inferior view showing the geniculate nuclei over here in orange. And this gives you a nice perspective of how the thalamus is partitioned into these subtypes. We did a heat map for the thalamus, which you can see here. And um, the heat map was um, not as informative or helpful as the uh, heat maps for the brainstem. But in essence, they showed us that the um, deficits that patients present with really had more to do with their relationship to the internal capsule. Uh, this is such a small area, and the internal capsule is such a critically eloquent structure that um, the different uh, heat maps really uh, uh, corresponded to how the lesion affected the motor fibers as they descended in the corticospinal tract or the sensory fibers uh, as they ascended in the um, different sensory systems and so forth. And these just summarize um, the various uh, presentations that really result, uh, uh, resolve to either sensory, motor, or visual disturbances. These are the approaches. Um, this is a summary illustration that shows that many of these approaches to the thalamus are taken through the ventricular system. You see that um, the approaches for three of the six are through the ventricle in one of these variations of a transcolossal uh, approach. The others are either from the back, going supracerebellar, uh, infratentorial or transtentorial, or from the side going transsylvian, which you see there in red. As an example, uh, this is the medial thalamic type, and this is a transcolossal, transchoroidal fissure, and it, it uses the contralateral trajectory to get the right angle into the medial thalamus. So uh, this is the anatomy. It's a beautiful anatomical view that opens up right alongside the fornix to get through the velum interpositum and into the third ventricle, and the lesions present on that medial surface. The uh, choroidal thalamic subtype is shown here. Um, this is basically a lesion that sits right underneath the choroid plexus. Um, it's on that superior surface of the thalamus, and there's no need to get out of the body of the lateral ventricle. It's all in the lateral ventricle. It doesn't require opening into the um, third ventricle through the choroidal fissure, but is right there on the surface. When we talk about the, uh, the lateral group, um, this is the area in red. This is done through a transinsular exposure going transsylvian to expose the candelabra, work between and through the M2 vessels, through the insular cortex, and to the posterolateral aspect of the thalamus. For the lesions in the back, uh, this is the pulvinar thalamic subtype. And um, you can see the uh, paramedian supracerebellar approach does a really nice job dropping the cerebellum, getting into that quadrigeminal cistern, uh, getting the infragolenic triangle exposed and working right between precentral cerebellar and basal vein of Rosenthal. So uh, this is that approach for that one, not unlike what we talked about in the brainstem for the um, quadrigeminal lesions. Uh, moving uh, on, uh, I think I'll, I'll skip some of these videos. Um, maybe just show this one. Um, this is a, a transcolossal transchoroidal fissure approach. Uh, you can see it here, and um, this is in that medial wall of the thalamus, uh, and the approach for this is a bifrontal craniotomy going through the anterior inner hemispheric fissure using gravity to retract and then uh, dropping into the ventricle. So how that looks is just going down that interhemispheric fissure, getting alongside the ACA vessels. We can then drop into the lateral ventricle here. And as we get into the ventricle, we now have to go transchoroidal fissures. So uh, I'm cauterizing the choroid plexus. This is our choroidal fissure up here. This is the fornix. And by going right along the fornix, we take that frame of Monroe from its native size here to an, a near doubling of that size along the fornix. That gets us into the uh, top of the um, third ventricle. 
And as we drop in, we can see our cavernous malformation sitting here in that medial uh, portion of the thalamus and the bottom of the third ventricle. So uh, it's a really beautiful approach, takes us right to the pathology. And you can see how, even though we're talking about a deep thalamic lesion, we can get that out. So um, let's go on to the basal ganglia. Now the, the basal ganglia, um, this is now, um, there are now three uh, subtypes in this group. There's the caudate, putamen, and the palatal. They're shown here in the colors, the caudate in blue, putamen in red, and the globus pallidus in orange. So these are the uh, three subtypes. This is the smallest of the various types, only three with this. And um, they're shown here. This is just another view showing the uh, perspectives from the front, back, side, and inferior. Uh, so you can see um, how the caudate, putamen, and globus pallidus relate to one another. Uh, for these, um, the symptoms vary. For the caudate lesions, you can get patients with abulia. Uh, you can see the um, circuitry here and the disruption of the circuits that can lead to abulia. Um, you can also get some disinhibition or depression, as well as memory problems uh, when they affect the, the fornix. Uh, and here you can see the location uh, in the typically in the head or body of the caudate. The putaminal lesions are shown in red. These are on that lateral uh, part of the basal ganglia, just deep to the insular cortex. And you can see that in red. Um, the uh, patients present here with some uh, dystonic, dystonic features and the circuits are shown here. We don't have time to get into those details, but you can study those um, in the, uh, the papers that are out. Um, and um, the uh, approaches now um, are what follow from the subtyping. So depending on how you've labeled your lesion, you can then uh, follow the, the trail from subtype to diagnosis to approach and, and come up with your approaches. So for the caudate lesions, we're gonna use a contralateral transcolosal approach for the um, uh, pentaminal lesions, we're going to use a transinsular, transsylvian uh, approach. And for the um, uh, palatal lesions, we're going to go transsylvian, super carotid. And let me just show you uh, another perspective on that. You can see um, the um, bifrontal craniotomy for the caudate lesions, the terional exposure for the um, transsylvian uh, putaminal uh, lesions. And the super carotid approach here is through an orbitozygomatic because you need that trajectory upwards that uses the orbital space to gain you that uh, elevation or of the ascent. So here's some more detailed pictures showing the palatal type. So this is that uh, orbitozygomatic transsylvian super carotid approach. We're basically going like we would for an aneurysm, except we're going between the A1 and the M1. Uh, we need to sometimes go through a little bit of the anterior perforated substance here. That gets us up into the region here of the uh, globus pallidus, avoiding the eloquent structures uh, more posteriorly. We also have to be careful of the uh, lenticulostrites that come out of the A1 and the M1 as they ascend, and those need to be sometimes traversed. For the putaminal subtype, this is going to be transsylvian, transinsular. Um, like what I showed you for the thalamic lesions. Uh, you can see the, um, the lesion sitting here. Uh, this is uh, really on the insular surface, but by going through the insula, we get right to the, the putamen uh, for access to these lesions. Um, I'll quickly show you this one. This is a transinsular approach for a palatal lesion. Uh, here's the, uh, the lesion here. You can see um, how it sits uh, in the head of the caudate and the uh, putamen. We're going to go through a transsylvian approach for this through the short gyri of the insula. This is our uh, overview of the exposure. We'll open up that sylvian fissure. We get into the candelabra vessels here. And then uh, by going through a little bit of insular cortex, which we can see right here, uh, about a centimeter's worth, we get right to the capsule of the lesion, which has that classic mulberry appearance. We can then um, work our plane of dissection around this thing. This was a quite firm one. So, we, whoops, had to um, break it down and uh, remove it uh, piecemeal. Hold on a sec. All right, sorry about that. All right, so um, 
that basically takes us through thalamus and basal ganglia. And now let's turn our attention next to cerebrum. So uh, when we talk about the cerebrum, there basically are four subtypes for that. Um, convexity, medial, basal, and sylvian. Um, the usual naming for the lobe also applies. So there's a frontal, parietal, occipital, and temporal. Um, and so that, that gives you basically um, four subtypes, uh, but um, these additional descriptors for 14 categorizations in all. And uh, I'll just show you what that looks like. The convexity lesions are the biggest. They encompass um, all of the lateral convexity, so frontal, parietal, occipital, and temporal. You can see them in different shades of purple with the usual dividing lines between them. Uh, this is a view of the convexity lesions from the top. You'll notice that um, uh, uh, the frontal, uh, parietal, uh, occipital and temporal, they all, they're four different convexity types for all the different lobes. That's not the case for some of the others, uh, which we'll talk about in just a minute. But here you see the occipital convexity. Here we're looking at the medial surface of the hemisphere. And for these, we see these in shades of green. So here we have four different um, medial surfaces, frontal, parietal, occipital, and temporal. For the basal, there are only three. We're missing a basal parietal surface, but we have frontal, temporal, and occipital. So you see three different ones here. And uh, this is another view showing the uh, basal surfaces um, uh, from the front. And for the sylvian, uh, we have a um, temporal, frontal, and a parietal sylvian surface. We do not have a sylvian occipital surface, surface so there are only three of those uh, for the sylvian subtype, uh, but they're shown here. And uh, here they are in their color map. So frontal sylvian, uh, parietal sylvian, and temporal sylvian. Um, so what we did uh, with these patients, these are their various lesions um, shown true to their shape and size. Uh, and we studied these um, uh, in our uh, surgical series. So there were about 360 of these. Um, these are the same lesions represented as dots, uh, showing that they cover most of the terrain in the cerebrum. And just to give you a flavor, uh, these were the various approaches that we selected. Uh, convexity approaches are pretty simple. They're usually mini craniotomies right over the site of the lesion where they come to the surface. And then it's a matter of just selecting either a transylvian, uh, excuse me, a transgyral or a transsulcal approach. Um, in general, um, if it's on the surface and you can get to it directly, uh, we choose a transgyral approach. If they're deeper, if they're um, subcortical, uh, we tend to find the best gyrus that leads down to it and then work our way through the gyrus so that we can minimize the amount of brain tissue that we go through. So these just show the various approaches. The thickness of the arrow is proportionate to the number of approaches that we do. And those are shown um, here uh, on the right and the left hemispheres. Same type of illustration here for the uh, medial lesions. We've got um, the arrows showing the frequency of the approaches and you can recognize how um, the interhemispheric fissure is really important for these. Uh, it gave, gives you great access to the gyri and sulci on this medial surface and allows you to get uh, directly to them. These are our basal approaches, many of these taken through subtemporal or transylvian exposures. And here, um, the sylvian approaches, again, uh, these are lesions that are along the banks of the sylvian fissure. Most of these were done by working through the uh, Sylvian Fisher itself, but also these additional uh, gyri were taken. Um, this is a, a case example. Um, it's a transtentorial approach for a basal I occipital basal lesion. Occipital so for this lesion, you can see it's on the basal surface of the occipital lobe. Uh, this is one that you could go transcortical, but um, by going in the sitting position and going supracerebellar transtentorial, uh, what you're going to see is that we avoid having to go through any cortex. We basically use gravity. We drop the cerebellum. We can make an incision here in the tentorium. This then allows us to climb upwards into the supratentorial compartment. And by making this little um, doorway or hatch, we can um, expose the arachnoid. We can um, find the malformation right here in this uh, sulcus. You can see the nice 
hemosiderin stain and also the uh, course of the posterior cerebral arteries as they run um, run right by. But we're going to work right in between these branches of the PCA. See the parent artery deep to the And then uh, just by climbing up, we follow the hemosiderin. We get right to the cavernous malformation, which is here. And uh, we can do our circumdissection, free it from its adhesions, and ultimately we can pull this right down and out through this this uh, little hatchway in the tentorium. So here, um, with round knives, you have to kind of work this free, kind of pull it down into your field of view. And here you can see it just nicely peeling free and dropping down into our field. So this becomes a um, superficial approach by choosing a gravity-assisted um, approach over the cerebellum. This is, again, using these uh, nice little tricks that we've developed for our more complicated surgeries for some of these simpler surgeries. So there you have it. Okay, so um, here are the outcomes. Um, th these are the outcomes in the series. Um, again, 360 patients, good outcomes in 87%. Poor outcomes here. Um, and you can see, um, generally speaking, these uh, patients do quite well. Now, um, one of the things that we wanted to look at we wanted to be really particularly hard on ourselves and look at other um, ways to pick up functional decline. So we looked at um, cognitive deficits as identified by these variables, either time in rehab, additional brain in imaging six months after surgery, office visits beyond six months, and referrals to neuropsychology or neuropsychiatry. We were essentially looking for things that might indicate that we had set the patient back and affected them with uh, with surgery. And by doing so, we identified 47 more patients. We nearly doubled the number of patients, um, or more than doubled the number of patients that were um, uh, identified using traditional modified Rankin scales. And this allowed us to, um, to look at this uh, issue of cortical eloquence. And um, there's this is Donald Rumsfeld. He's, uh, he was Secretary of Defense back in the Bush administration. And you know, when it comes to eloquence, there are the known knowns or the, the areas that we know are eloquent. There are also the um, uh, known unknowns. There are areas that we know are not eloquent, but then there are the unknown unknowns, the things that we don't know. And that's really um, using that logic, what we were looking for. We were looking for what I call the eloquent, non-eloquent areas. We all know the eloquent areas. Those are the motor strip, the visual cortex and so forth. Uh, there are also some areas that we can agree upon as being non-eloquent uh, that we routinely resect or transect without consequence. But then there are areas that um, we think of as non-eloquent, but they are in fact eloquent. And we were looking for those. So what we did was we took all of our lesion maps, which you see here in this illustration. Uh, we then um, looked at the areas. These are parcellations of brain based upon the connectome, the human connectome project. And we identified those lesions that um, seem to have some correlation with a poor outcome. And we did the same with our surgical trajectories. These were lesions that were deep, that required transgressing cortical tissue. And um, we looked at the areas that were affected by our surgical trajectory. And when we put those together, we found seven areas. Um, we found seven areas that we uh, traditionally don't think of as eloquent, at least based upon some of the... Uh, more well-known um, uh, metrics or systems. And, and these were ones that we identified, the supplementary motor area, the anterior cingulate, the posterior cingulate, frontal pole on the right side, the left anterior insula, the mesial left temporal lobe, and the occipital cortex on the right side. So these are what we call the seven hotspots. And these are uh, some of these hotspots. Th this is the supplementary motor area with the parcellations here. Um, this is the left anterior insular region shown here. Um, the uh, anterior and posterior cingulate gyri are shown here. Um, and also the right um, visual cortex uh, shown back here in yellow. These are all hot spots. Um, here's that left ancillar, uh, anterior insular region uh, again shown here. And then finally, the, the right frontal pole. Um, and also the left mesial temporal lobe. So those are the seven hotspots that came out. And 
you know, um, we tried to figure out, you know, why exactly these were emerging as uh, areas of eloquence when they're traditionally um, considered non-eloquent. And I, I think the way to understand this is uh, by thinking about brain networks, these large scale brain networks that are shown in these um, turntables here. Some of these are familiar to you, like the sensory motor system, the limbic system, the language system, uh, the visual system. These are, are obvious brain networks that we all appreciate and understand. But some of the others are less well appreciated, like central executive over here, Default mode network is shown up here. This is the, the network that's involved in processing or daydreaming or organizing our, our, um, our thoughts. We've got the salience network here shown in green. This is the network that switches, does all the switching between one network being active and then another act, uh, network being inactive. And this switching mechanism is really important to get all of these various brain networks uh, working smoothly together. Um, the other um, interesting networks are dorsal attention, uh, ventral attention. These are the things that listen to our internal system or uh, our external systems when we're doing uh, higher order tasks. We need these attention networks to get ourselves focused on doing the work. So this is the, um, the idea of the brain networks. And this is, I think, what explains um, the, um, um, explains the deficits that we see. So um, I just want to um, talk a little bit about uh, eloquent cortex. You know, this is the Spetzler-Martin grading system. And when we talk about AVMs, uh, and we look back at this paper in 1986, this illustration summarizes what he described as the eloquent brain for AVM grading. So you can see in orange, the speech areas, uh, green, Broca's uh, or Wernicke's area. You see motor in red, uh, sensor, sensory strip in blue visual cortex uh, in blue. And these were what accounted for the scoring on the grading system. Um, Albert Einstein is attributed with this quote. He says that humans only use 10% of their brains. And, and that's a really um, um, apt quote because it sort of summarizes what we as neurosurgeons consider eloquence. The eloquent areas are shown in these pictures from seven AVMs in color. And you can see that most of the brain is in white. These are what we would normally ascribe as non-eloquent. Well, um, when you throw in into the picture those brain networks that I was talking about before, here shown in color, what you can notice is that pretty much the whole cerebral cortex is involved in one of these networks, that all of this brain is there for a reason. It's involved in one network or another. And by going through what we would traditionally call non-eloquence, uh, we're actually going to disrupt things and cause some harm. And so these are those networks shown um, in a different form. You see visual, sensory motor, central executive, and limbic. Um, these cover a lot of the terrain of the cerebral cortex. Then when we throw in salience and default mode network, ventral and dorsal attention, we really are stacking up all of this area of eloquence that um, becomes out of bounds for us, that by going through that, we're going to end up hurting people and causing uh, cognitive deficits. So um, what I come to at the end of all this is that human connectomics and an understanding of these brain networks are really at odds with our neurosurgical conception of eloquence. We think of this far too simplistically. And um, the areas that we treat as non-eloquent, um, things that we treat as non-eloquent um, are in fact eloquent, and we need to revise or reconsider how we uh, we think about this. What we're trying to get to is a concept of what I call cortical safe entry zones, very much like what we have in the brainstem. Um, we, we should be able to define these cortical safe entry zones that um, uh, allow us to select our entry sites that avoid these networks. And I think um, what we need to do is modernize our conception of eloquence. Um, so, uh, Thinking back, this is Wilder Penfield. He developed the uh, idea of the homunculus, which you can see uh, in this illustration. You can see the somatosensory homunculus. You can see the motor homunculus. And this is a very helpful concept to allow us to think about how the brain is somatotopically laid out. Uh, it's helpful in you know avoiding the uh, uh, 
the face uh, motor areas, the hand motor areas. It really is a nice construct or concept that allows us to um, do better as surgeons. This is uh, another view showing uh, the motor and the sensory uh, homunculi as these sort of uh, proportionalized figures. Uh, but you can see how, again, how helpful this, uh, this conceptualization is of somatotopy. Well, I think what we need to do um, now is to do the same with these large-scale brain networks, is to find a way to understand the somatotopy within these networks, to try and understand or develop a way to create a modern homunculus that lets us appreciate these various networks and avoid them at all costs. So we're trying to move from this very crude concept of a safe entry zone with these linear incisions in the brainstem to a cortical safe entry zone map here uh, with these linear incisions that, uh, that take us through the cerebrum in a safe way. So um, with that all said, um, you know, the seven cavernomas book is uh, nearly done. Um, in fact, before the lecture, I was working on this, trying to hammer this uh, through and get to the finish line. Um, I think that our resections can be optimized by maximizing the amount of transsulcal dissection that we do by shortening the distance to the targets, minimizing cortical transgression, and then resecting these lesions inside their capsules so that we protect the brain around it. I think we all need to spend time learning these brain networks and these connectomics because that's really how we explain these areas of eloquent non-eloquence or hotspots. We're trying to um, update our homunculus. Um, you'll see a paper coming soon uh, about this, but I can tell you that it's a very difficult task uh, and we're not there yet. Uh, there is technology in the meantime that incorporates a lot of these network uh, anatomical renderings into the surgical uh, guidance systems, and that can be very helpful in planning your approach. So um, with that, I think I'm gonna stop and um, I uh, appreciate your attention. Thank you very, very much, sir, for this wonderful lecture. It means a lot to us. And um, again, we are so much deeply grateful for you for all these wonderful lectures. And I've also shared a few of your wonderful uh, papers which were relevant. Uh, sir, there are a couple of questions. Uh, would you like me to share them with you? Sure. Thank you so much, sir. Sir, there is one question uh, from Dr. Sirajuddin Araji. Ar 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 I guess uh, that he wants to ask something about his, um, like the extra axial cavernous angiomas, like the intrasinus, the dural sinus cavernous angiomas, uh, because he's asking that uh, can we embolize the cavernomas like AV malformations? I guess this, this is different from the parenchymal cavernomas. The extra axial ones have that. Um, Maybe that option of own embolization, I'm not sure, but he's asking that can we embolize the cavernomas as an AVM? Well, so classically speaking, uh, cavernomas don't have an arterial blood yes. supply, so um, they can't be embolized in the traditional way. Um, um, there are some very rare ones in dural sinuses that mm -hmm. um, um, seem to have some um, access either through the veins or through very dilated capillaries. And I have seen some cases of embolization, but um, but by and large, the, the answer is no. Um, you really can't embolize a cavernous malformation. These are things that you have to um, essentially tackle surgically and um, just separate them from brain tissue and get them out. The, the um, things that you're asking about, the extra axial cavernomas are rare birds. They're, they're often they don't feel or look the same. So um, the, uh, I've always wondered whether we've gotten their pathology right or, or whether they're actually something that's um, slightly different. Thank you very much, sir. I think that uh, they are considered uh, like a little different entity, the extra axial ones and the intracinus ones, probably they are treated a little differently, not like a parenchymal cavernoma. Some people, I think, I'm I'm not sure we haven't, uh, we've never seen that. I've just only read about them, uh, but I think that, that that's a different uh, entity. But how would you like to treat them uh, if, if you find the extra axial ones? Well, the extra axial ones are a lot of fun. I mean, um, <laughs> You know, when you see them in the optic chiasm, um, when you see them um, on cranial nerves, uh, you know, they're, they're not in brain per se, but they're still in nervous tissue and they're, they can be challenging to get out without harming the nerve or whatever structure they're in. Um, you know, I think um, uh, 
you have to just ask yourself what the morbidity is relative to the benefit. If it's in a, a dural sinus and it isn't causing any um, symptoms or problems, then uh, a hemorrhage from that kind of a lesion is not going to harm the patient. You don't have to be overly aggressive in chasing those. But um, um, if they are causing symptoms, like if it's in the orbit and it's causing propto proptosis, for example, you know that may be a lesion you might want to chase. Um, if it's obstructing a a major venous outflow channel and causing venous hypertension, that's another lesion you may want to chase. So it just needs to be um, evaluated individually, case by case. Thank you so much, sir. Sir, there, uh, there, there are plenty of questions in the chat box. So there is another uh, question, rather three questions from Dr. Juan Miguel. Uh, he wants to ask, sir, uh, first of all, thank you very much and congratulations for your magnificent and impeccable work. Without a doubt, your work is a masterpiece of modern neurosurgery. So I would like to ask three aspects. Number one, regarding small asymptomatic or polysymptomatic melanomas, is the natural history different? Is the observation strategy better for asymptomatic or poses symptomatic avenomas? Well, the, the bleeding risk is the same. Um, there, there's really no difference um, in how they biologically will behave. If they're asymptomatic, it means that either they've bled and they just haven't produced symptoms because they're in a quiet part of the brain or um, that they, they've been dormant, they haven't actually bled yet. Um, so their bleeding risk is about the same. Um, their their surgical management is the same. I think the indication's different. If if they're asymptomatic and the patient's fine, that may be something you just sit with and um, uh, observe with serial MR imaging over years and um, see how the um, the patient progresses. If they're if they remain asymptomatic even without deficits, then you can continue that strategy. Uh, thank you very much, sir. Uh, uh, what what routine would you like to follow for a serial MRI, sir? Some people like suggest a yearly MRI. Would you like to do a yearly MRI? Or some people say that for those who are incidental findings, they would uh, the the use of a yearly MRI is rather debatable. So, what would uh, would you prefer? Yeah, um, I generally do yearly MRIs, particularly in patients with multiple cavernous malformations or familial syndromes. Um, it's always good to just um, stay on top of the bleeding behavior. Um, if a patient's had a, a dormant or quiescent malformation for years and years, then it's certainly possible just to uh, stretch that out to every two years, every five years, and image when there are new symptoms that develop. Uh, sir, there are some um, growing interest in so-called, uh, you know, the cash biomarkers, which they say, like including the VAGF, that they say that could indicate an impending risk of bleeding. Sir, uh, what, do you think they, they are really promising in case of um, like those given over that we are uh, following and observing? Do you think that these biomarkers can be helpful? Well, the cash trial is, is a trial. We're, we're basically gathering the data and we're learning. Um, I'm not sure that we can say that um, they're predictive of hemorrhage. I think what we have to do is just enroll patients, collect the markers, see if there's some sort of a pattern that emerges that correlates with um, hemorrhagic lesions versus non-hemorrhagic lesions. And um, my hope is um, is that there will be. Um, we're a participant in that trial or in that study, and um, you know I'd like to think that um, there are there is something that um, will be a predictor of hemorrhage, but um, we got to do the science first. Exactly. So those uh, which are radiation induced, sir, uh, um, some of the studies, they say that they have a higher risk for hemorrhage. And uh, so there are also some studies that indicate that the use of bevacizumab has so shown to, uh, you know, uh, to be causing regression of those radiation induced uh, echivanomas. Sir, uh, do, you, do you think that uh, it is true that the, will you have uh, some other strategy for the radiation induced multiple echivanomas? which will be different from the from the strategy for other multiple familial cavernomas. Well, um, I, I think that um, the, the post-radiation cavernous malformation, the, these can be tough ones. I, I think they're a little bit nastier than the natural or garden variety cavernoma. So um, I do think they can be a little more um, hemorrhagic. Um, I'm not convinced that a drug therapy is going to be the way with these. I think... Um, uh, they should probably be managed like any other cavernous malformation with an eye towards surgery as the first line. And if it's um, treatable 
and resectable, then I think um, going for a cure is obviously much better than just treating with medicines. Um, Bevacizumab is a, a very expensive drug. Um, it's not um, uh, been definitively proven to eradicate or cure these. So I, I think um, you know the burden of proof is is on us to show that it works before we um, use that or embrace that as a first line treatment. Thank you so much, sir. Sir, there's uh, another question. What is the best strategy in the operating room for those cavernomas which are associated with DVAs? How to avoid post-operative thrombosis? Well, I think the best way to uh, avoid damage to a DVA or a venous malformation is to carefully protect it. You can see them very clearly uh, on the preoperative imaging. You should know where they are. And when you're taking out the pathology, um, uh, I do everything possible to preserve them. Now, sometimes the fingers of the caput medusa can interact with the pathology. So you may end up taking a finger or two, but as long as you preserve the trunk and you're respectful of the trunk, then um, you'll be fine. It, it's always a good idea to avoid these because um, they bleed like sinuses. They're quite, um, they're quite uh, bloody and, um, I think the best uh, prevention of having to deal with that problem is to avoid them. Thank you so much, sir. So there is uh, another um, uh, study that I came across where they say that there is a paradoxical role of antithrombotic agents. So they said that uh, sometimes the antithrombotic agents uh, also decrease uh, the risk of hemorrhage because it also prevents thrombosis inside the cavernous malformation. And so there's also some uh, concerns about the use of a and often appropriate analgesics for patients with the cavernous malformations. And some people say that the anesthetics, some people say that um, uh, if, if for an asymptomatic patient, it, it won't cause any harm. Uh, while other uh, other doctors say that it they, they, they should be avoided in any case. And there's another third group that say that anesthetics even have um, decreased the risk of uh, cerebral hemorrhage. So uh, do you, what, what's your view regarding the use of antithrobotics and uh, the use of anesthetics in patients with Cavernous yeah. Um, well, there's there's a really conflicted literature. Um, my I, I come down on the side of not knowing any strong contraindication for NSAIDs in these patients, and so um, I don't restrict the use. Thank you so much, sir. So there's also a question uh, regarding the use of propranolol uh, preoperatively, and there's also a question regarding the appropriate, the best timing of surgery in a hemorrhagic patient. Um, sorry, uh, what, what what was the first question? Uh, sir, the first question was that pre -op uh, regarding the preoperative use of propranolol. Oh, propranolol, right. Um, well, um, I use propranolol in patients that really are avoiding surgery, don't want surgery, or have a lesion that's non-operable, too deep. Um, these are sometimes um, uh, the brainstem patients that um, are clinically doing well, have a deep lesion that's inaccessible. Th those um, might be ones that you try on propranolol or some other medical uh, regimen. But... Um, I don't use them, I don't use propranolol as a preoperative adjunct. Like it's not um, something that I use to prep a, a lesion for surgical resection. Thank you so much. And the other question was, sir, uh, regarding the best timing of surgery after a lesion has bled. Well, um, the best time, in my opinion, is somewhere uh, in that first one to eight weeks after a hemorrhage, because if there's uh, blood, it's liquefied, it can help separate the, the malformation from the adjacent brain tissue. Um, you can use that liquefaction to develop your dissection planes, or if it's all intracapsular, you can use that liquefaction to decompress or collapse the capsules. So um, I think it's good to capitalize on those hemorrhagic events. Um, when you wait longer than that, the blood uh, products go away, there can be scar tissue and increased adhesion to the tissue. And so um, it can be more difficult to extract. And I think also on the flip side, you don't want to operate so early that you're operating on edematous brain where it's harder to develop those separation planes. Thank you so much, sir. Sir, I think we have 
Deacon Alon, for your time. Thank you so much, sir, for sparing your time. I know you have a very, very busy schedule, but we are so much grateful to you that you always, you, you, you for your dedication uh, towards neurosurgical education. So thank you so, so much for, for your kind lecture as well as your discussion. There are so many wishes and uh, for you uh, and so many regards from every part of the world, almost every part of the world for you in the chat box. Sir, again, I'm, I'm so short of words to show how much deeply um, I'm grateful to you and on the behalf of all the attendees right now we are so much grateful to you for your wonderful lecture uh, mm. well, thank you it's a pleasure to see you again Nora and uh, congratulations again on putting these together Thank you so so much, sir. It's a it's it's a matter of huge pleasure and honor for me. So whenever I invite you, sir, I cannot I cannot tell you how much I'm I'm always I always feel honored and how much grateful I always feel to you, sir. I've just released a book with Professor Luis Warba on basic cranial approaches, sir. I really wish to share that book with you, and yeah. I would it would be it would be so nice to um uh, to request you if you may write a uh, um write a few words about the book if you have any time if you have some time sure. we will be so I happy to. to Thank you so much. I will be emailing that okay. book to you, sir. Thank you so much. It means okay. so much Great. to all of us. Great. Great seeing you and have a great holidays. Thank you so much, sir. Happy holidays to you as well. Thank you okay. so much, sir. All right. Bye-bye now. Thank you so much again. Uh, so again, thank you very much uh, for um, uh, for taking uh, interest in this lecture. And I have shared the link of the quiz. Have you uh, have have every one of you received the link to the quiz? Uh, because uh, that link is in the in the chat box. Kindly submit the quiz. There is no passing percentage uh, for the quiz. You just have to attend the exam and submit it. All of uh, your uh, certificate will be emailed to you. Uh, all right, of the submission because it is an automatically generated email, uh, automatically generated certificate. So please uh, submit it right now. It will be great. Okay. Um, if you wish to have, okay, yeah, sure. You can see it again. I share you the link of my YouTube channel. Please subscribe to my channel and you will be able to, you know, um, to get all of my updates. Uh, all of these videos are available on my YouTube channel and you can also find it on, on my website. It's the newsneuro.xyz. So I have our... Thank you so much, Doctor uh, Professor Lunit Kinat Kintana. Thank you so much. Um, um, thank you so much, and so much, so many greetings to Chile as well. I I can see there are so many conferences in Chile and amazing people uh, from Chile. I've met so many colleagues from your part of the world. So it's so great to see you all here. So have any everyone of you received the link to the quiz? Kindly submit the quiz and you will have your um, link of the article I missed. Okay, uh, sure, no problem. Uh, uh, there, uh, there are a few of the important papers that I wish you, you can, uh, you, you could see. Uh, because um, I've been curating them. And this is linked to the seven Kevinuma, uh, seven series by Professor Michael Lawton that you should uh, watch. Um, I've been watching them since a very long time myself. Uh, oh no. Oh, I think I have written in the, I think the right. I was on okay. So this is I'm sharing the link to to the to the Google form again. And this is the journal uh this is the link. I'm sorry, I have sent this to somebody. Uh, and this is the YouTube link of, of Professor Lawton 7 series. I'm not sending you the form link again. Uh, and please submit, uh, subscribe to my YouTube channel for further updates. I'm also starting a podcast, so uh, please uh, do um, 
Thank you so much, Dr. Anila, so much. Dr. Bennett is here. Hi, Dr. Bennett, how are you today? Cannot see you. Okay, so here is the link to my uh YouTube uh, to my you know um WhatsApp group. Please uh subscribe to my WhatsApp group to stay updated. Hello, Dr. Bennett. Where are you? Uh, I cannot see you. Hi. I can Hold see you. Okay, there's a there's an Android behind you. Say send it, please. Please uh, send, put the link on the chat, okay? Yeah, and, yeah, I, I'll share that. Uh, but what, yeah, but what have you done? Yeah, I, I, hold so hold on, be, let me get... Should, I'm I'm I be, on, should I be suspecting an Android instead of you? Are you real or are you an AI-generated uh, version of Dr. Bennett? <laughs> oh, man. Man, should oh, I, man. I have a couple of screens open, nowhere, and getting sound from everywhere. Hey, that was a great, great uh, chat. Hey, I uh, just put in the chat you know, the link to the uh, quiz, okay? So I can put it on my website. Yeah, please, sure, sure. Let let me send it to you. If there are people mm -hmm. on the, you know, even if there are people on um, on the YouTube channel and uh, on Neurosurgical TV, please send yeah, this to yeah, them. The, yeah, this will yeah. go. Yeah, this will yeah, go yeah, all please. my. All my followers, uh, as you okay, know, the, I can let, me the, uh, let, let, let me send it to you on your, you know, on your Facebook as well. Uh, on your, uh, do you have your um, WhatsApp with you? I have WhatsApp that to yeah. you. Yeah, yeah, you can put it in WhatsApp too. Uh, I, I'm clicking to you. There, I got it. I got it. Okay. Yeah, do, do you do it? Yeah, okay. I got yeah, it. Yeah, 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 exactly. This one, yeah. You know, I'm starting a podcast now. I'm I'm adding a new dimension. I'm starting a podcast now. But you can't see your pretty face with the podcast. Ah, uh, thank you. That's, that, that, that's for ugly people. The podcast. No, then they're not ugly people. You know, I'm so much inspired with all the podcasts, and I was even considering my sister to start a podcast with me. I was saying that I should start a podcast, like you know, Jason and Travis Kelsey. We should start a new oh, hype too. Dope. Dope. <laughs> the, the pictures are much better. Uh, that that to me, that's part of communication is the visual aspect, as you know from being a doctor. Yeah. You know, the, when you walk what? into a room and see a patient's face, that says you so much more than anything else. You know, so. uh, you, yeah, exactly. But you know, actually, there's a there are limitations of time. You know, all the time I receive a lot of queries. People ask me regarding, you know, so many questions: how to prepare for exams and how to prepare for MCQs and etc. Cetera, etc. Cetera, things like this. So I really, really, really wish to help people out. You know, I because I think that it's like a responsibility when you are senior and you have been through all this hell and you know all the things uh, neurosurgery better than me. So I was thinking that I should help people more. So I added this new dimension of adding a podcast because it will be much easier for me to answer each of the query in detail and so that everyone can you know listen to the podcast i will be uh, it will be in english so that everyone can listen to the podcast so i will be able to help people more i've i've been asking everyone to send me questions i will you know um create a podcast on each of the questions what do you think i think it, it will help well you, you know you know nor i think these days are the biggest days in education yes. in, hi in history. In history. Yes. Exactly. Because, because of the captions. Because yes. that expands. This webcast in the future will be translated, of course, into other language. But it's a live, real-time translation that makes it a killer. Yes. Real, live, live. Like, for example, we you know, televising in Russian. Yes. The Russian audience is able to understand the English because they have Russian subtitles in real time. So that a Russian, right? a Ru Russian neurosurgeon is, is very hesitant to, to present in English because he feels bad. But he can, he can do it in Russian and be translated accurately into English. You are it's, so right. You're so right. It's, it's like a game changer that's huge news huge. yeah and it's a game changer yeah it is 
For sure, for sure. So, I, I, you know, there's a huge international conference in Japan. They asked yes. me to do that because of that reason, because of this caption is going to go yeah. to, to makes it convenient for people to go to live events, live, like you're doing now, it's live events. It's huge. Yeah, it's it's totally a game changer. And you know what? It's already twenty second. It's twenty second December at your part of the world, and it's already twenty third December here in Pakistan. So I'm one year ahead of you. Well, it makes what we're doing more valuable now. Yeah, more exactly. valuable. It's like a time we're, travel. We're, we're, not patty, <laughs> we're not patting ourselves on the back. That's just yeah. a fact. Your yeah, totally. Podcasts are getting more valuable. So you let's know, make the, some good ones. Yeah, and did you listen to Professor Michael Lawton? What he did is say, he said, uh, no, congratulations. And he said that uh, you're keeping the webinars alive. And I was so much happy that he appreciated all those webinars I've done. I'm so happy today. Oh, that's good. That's great. Okay, yeah, <laughs> I enjoyed that. That's great. Okay, no, let's keep rolling. Thank you, but you're when, as, as long as you are around. So it's hey, amazing look, look to at me. All, look at all the people you have here. Anybody want to say you, hi? Yeah, please turn, oh, turn your... Marco, Marco, how are you doing? Marco from uh, Cuba. Where you are, Marco? I would like everyone to Hello. turn their... Hello, hey, 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 Marco. Marco. You, you know, you know Noah, right? You yeah. know Noah, right? Yeah, he does. How, Dr. Marco, how are you? Hello, good up. <laughs> yes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Yeah, yeah, Marco, I, I wanted to ask you if you're going to host I'm doing great. talk. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Thank you for the opportunity to be here. Oh, we cannot hear you. Uh, yeah, the, the, it's it's uh, yeah, bad, yes, yes, bad exactly. I will be on sound. Maybe. Can you hear me? Take your picture off. Take your picture off, Marco. That may help your voice if you take your video off. You know what I mean? Can you can take, you hear me? Can you? Yeah, but not well. Take your video off. Oh yes. We can yes, can you hear me, John? Can you hear me? Yeah. Very much. Can you hear me now? Yeah, take take your take your picture off the screen. Hello? Yeah, we can hear you. Can you hear take me, John? Picture. Yeah, yeah, now yeah. it's better. It looks like I have a problem with uh I think it's at work. With, uh, with... Okay, uh, you know, okay, you, can you, you know hear me? I mean? You know what I mean, Nor? If you take your picture off like I'm doing now. Sometimes that helps the voice because oh. it l lessens the bandwidth. Take yeah. your picture can off. You Take your picture off. Can you? Yeah. No, no. no I guess he, he he's having some signals, uh, signal issues. Well, no. If he takes a picture off, he's going to have more bandwidth to play with. Take your picture there. Okay. Does that improve your sound? Yes. Can you hear me? Can you hear me now? Yeah, that's better. Is is clear or is still having a problem to hear me? It's is better. it clear it's or better? It's better. Okay, okay, okay. No, I, I, what I was saying, John. Yes, I will be on Sunday there. Uh, I will be there on the conference okay. with Ip, and and of course, I really enjoyed that today's conference, which was really incredible. And I want to thank uh, Noor for this amazing opportunity of uh, listening to Professor Lauten giving this amazing she, lecture. She, She's getting the big names. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, Marco, uh, Dr. Marco, I have missed which conference are you attending? Uh, this Sunday, uh, this Sunday, uh, Professor Ipe is coming back to give a lecture. So yeah, let me, yeah, let me, if you want, I'll screen share it, Noah. Can you enable me to screen share it? Yeah. And yeah also, yeah. also, I'll get free publicity for, from the people in, in the chat right now. I'll get yeah. to, to show off our work here. So let me get let me tell you show the audience. 